welcome to our webinar, uh, The Secret to Being a $10 million uh, MSP. My name is Stephanie Hammond. I'm uh, a Senior Channel Account Manager here at SolarWinds MSP, and I'm very pleased uh, to be your, your host today. Uh, very excited to get started, uh, but before we do, just a couple of quick housekeeping items to run through. Everybody's lines have been muted for the duration of the webinar, uh, but we definitely do encourage questions. And if you have a question that you would like to ask uh, our presenter, Eric, today, we invite you to use the question and answer panel on your dashboard, um, especially if you have any questions about how you know, you're wishing or how you're struggling or want to grow your MSP practice. Also, uh, a big question that we always get, you know, are we recording this session? We absolutely are. Uh, and so once the session recording is ready to go, uh, it will be sent out by our marketing department. So just keep an eye on your inbox uh, for that. So I'd like to take this time to welcome Eric Walk, uh, Rockwell to our session today. Uh, Eric is the CEO and co-founder of Centrix IT, one of the largest MSPs in California. Uh, Eric has been at the helm of Centrix IT for uh, over 12 years. And in that time, he has grown Centrix IT into a, a powerhouse MSP that now generates over $500,000 a month in recurring revenue. So very pleased to have you uh, here today, Eric. Well, thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> so I guess uh, to start off, um, you know, uh, the pressing question I think of the day is, you know, what drew you, what compelled you uh, to start an NFT practice? Well, it was actually, it's going to be 15 years to the day on July 1st. Ooh. Oh, okay, 15 so years. We're awesome. about 20, 22 days away and counting on that one. <laughs> Drew me was, I was young. My, uh, my partner, who is the co-founder of the company, was, was young. I was in a band with his cousin, and I was in, I was in college going to school for computer sciences and uh, just immersing myself in this world of technology that I love. And through, through pure chance, we started working together through that connection uh, that I had to his cousin. And we started doing little one-off uh, jobs here and there until we landed a real client that had seven locations. And uh, we literally got a check for 60 grand to build them a network. Wow. And that was it. And, uh, and it's been a long 15 years, but uh, man, I love the ride. And I would absolutely <laughs> do it if, if I had the opportunity. Excellent. Um, so, and I know in a lot of my own consulting work, you know, with my territory of partners, you know, especially when a new partner joins uh, SolarWinds, we have discussions around, you know, what makes for a successful MSP, you know, especially given uh, today's landscape. So in growing uh, your business, Eric, what would you say would be the key components that have led to the success that Centrix IT has, is experiencing today? Oh, my God. There have been so many of them. And it's kind of funny. As we continue to grow and scale, there's always some new key breakthrough that we have. But I think really high level, one of the big things that we did right early on that a lot of other companies in my peer group have struggled with is, is company culture. And we had, we had no idea that we were doing it right in the first place. We just wanted to have this fun, positive environment of cool IT guys who people wanted to work with. Mostly because I didn't want to work with, with some of these guys that were the opposite. It wasn't fun. And I knew my clients wouldn't like talking to them either. That, uh, okay, so that grew into, yeah, that, that grew into a culture of today we have 43 people. We're always growing. We're always looking for new talent. We're adding people on a regular basis based off of specific metrics that we have documented so that we don't uh, oversaturate our team and uh, we also don't let our team get overworked. But that culture, okay. we, we hired a consultant to come in who really helped us identify some of the key elements of what what the positive attributes of our culture were and create a document and training program on those elements, things like care and leadership, having authentic conversations 
with, with one another, whether it's a client, a person on the phone at the help desk, an executive, really understanding re the request behind a request and being able to make an authentic so that we can meet these commitments that we make with a very high degree of accuracy. And also having fun. Wow. You cannot lose sight of having fun. Excellent. And I know, again, with, with the work that I do and a lot of my colleagues do with our partners, you talk about the company culture, and that's probably one of the, the challenges that I hear a lot in my ongoing consulting work. You know, when I work with business owners, presidents, CEOs, you know, they're struggling with building that right company culture and, and getting that, that morale in place and getting you know, everybody on the same team with the same vision because they'll say, well, we have salespeople that don't understand managed services, so um, they're not selling it. Or we have techs that don't understand it or feel threatened by it, so they're not promoting it. They're not learning the software. They're throwing excuses out there why they can't learn the software because they're too busy. So advice to people yeah. on the line today, if they have that today, how do they break free from that? Those are all signs of lack of a shared commitment. So if you think about it, if, if you, so for, for the owners and uh, executives at MSPs out there, you have to enroll your team in this mission. And if you've never declared a mission before, that means that everybody has their own interpretation of why you're here. And maybe it's a job, maybe it's a career, maybe they know what the growth plan is and they know that they can, they can grow in their own career or they don't and they're going to look for that opportunity elsewhere. But this is not something that's very necessarily hard to do, but it's something that most uh, MSPs out there I've seen struggle with. You have to declare the mission. And there's no reason that I've found not to tell the entire team what the mission is, because you have to enroll them in that mission together, or they're going to be working on their own mission that may or may not be aligned with yours. There are financial measurements of that mission, growing to a certain size, growing to a certain headcount, growing to a certain profit, uh, profitability level. Our mission is to grow 33% year over year, and that puts us at $30 million in the next four years, specifically so that we can give everyone on our team career growth opportunities so that uh, we will not outgrow them and they will not outgrow us, but we want to maintain alignment as we go down this, this mission together and get to where we're going together. And along the way, when breakdowns happen and when, when challenges and struggles happen or when a new software system comes online, whatever, whatever the challenge is, if you have a shared commitment that you're all enrolled in, you can overcome them together. But without that shared commitment, it's really, really hard to overcome these challenges and, and be on the same page. It gets adversarial. You get into right versus wrong conversation, but if you think about it, as long as you're committed to that mission, learning a new software, that's just a part of the mission, and it really doesn't need to cause a challenge, but if you don't do it, it could impact the results. All right, so advice if, you, if someone's finding themselves looking at their team and they have people that do not share that commitment, don't see that vision. Well, first of all, you have to tell them what it is. You have to write it down. I mean, everybody on your team should be able to recite your core values right off the top of their head, and you should encourage that. And if people aren't enrolled in the mission, then unfortunately, you might have to find someone else who is. And that's okay, because you're not helping them by keeping them on a team that's committed to a mission together that they don't want to be a part of. And that's just a conversation that you have to have. Right. Okay. Good. Good message. Um, so, looking at you know MSPs out there that are looking to, to grow, uh, you know, grab new new uh, prospects. Um, what have you found to be the best lead generation tool, or what tools are you using in terms of lead gen uh, to find new prospects? For the company that's something that yeah that, that's something that, that I've struggled with for years and I always thought there was a magic silver bullet like if we just did this all this new business would be flooding in and and that was never the case what it is is it's, it's an engine 
it's a machine that's made up of all these different cylinders and they all have to be firing together to produce a consistent result. So we have a team of inside salespeople that are doing cold calling, they're managing lists, they're looking for companies that specifically align with the target profile that we're looking for. Companies that would make great clients that we could really help. And they're only, they're only doing a certain amount of calling, uh, specifically 600 dials a week per inside sales rep. They're only looking to have 10 conversations with executives per day, not IT directors, not IT managers, C-level executives only. And out of those conversations, they're looking to book a certain number of first-time appointments per week. These are companies that we can meet with, either qualify or disqualify, and find the best of the best that are going to be committed to us, we're going to be committed to them, and they're making the change for the right reason, not just because they, they sell for a sales tactic. But that's only one cylinder. We do a lot of SEO and pay-per-click uh, campaigns. We actually have one running right now where last month the CEO of a 150-person company clicked on one of the campaigns. They were specifically looking for a company like us. They called us, and we had a 37-minute conversation with them. The first thing they asked was what our hourly rate was, and I said, I'm sorry we don't have one. And after talking to them for five minutes, I said, you know what? I really don't think that we're going to be a good fit for you guys, but let me ask a few more questions so I can find someone who is. And after talking for 37 minutes, the way that they thought they should approach IT completely changed, and we had a, we had a meeting the following week. They came to our facility the week after, and uh, literally last week, we just signed them under a $20,000 a month managed services contract, three-week sales cycle. So that's another cylinder. And then referrals and meeting with centers of influence in the community, those two cylinders are gold. You can get referrals from employees, from your existing clients. I have a whole process that my team of ECIOs go through to help find opportunities within our clients' networks. And our clients, uh, we try to create raging fans with our clients, and they want to show us off. They want to brag about us, and they want to refer us to their other executive friends. And in centers of influence, these are people in the community who work in the same verticals that you work in, or they just work in the general business community. They may own copier companies, small copier companies, cabling companies, access control companies. They could be bankers. They could be lawyers. Uh, you know, business, uh, corporate attorneys, CPAs, other professionals, I have a specific list of COIs that I network with. So does my outside sales rep, so does my partner. And every month we meet with a certain number of centers of influence or COIs in the community and we get together for a happy hour. I show them my client list, my book of business and all the prospects that I'm working with and anyone that they might know because I looked at their LinkedIn page and saw who they were connected to and said, is there anyone here that you can introduce me to? And same thing, is there anything on my book of business? Uh, are there any clients here that you'd like an introduction to? And that simple process of networking produces a ton of high quality leads every year. And the net for us last year was closing more than 20 new clients that totaled $2 million in reoccurring revenue for this calendar year. Wow. But it's Phenomenal. not any one thing. It's all of those cylinders firing together. It's all, and it takes, it takes discipline. It takes a lot of process. But when you're small, you can do the same thing. The bad news is that you just have to muscle through it and do it yourself. But as long as you're documenting the process and following the process along the way, now you're creating something that can scale. If you never do that, it's going to be really hard to hire a salesperson and expect them to learn how to do it organically. But the good right. news is that when you are networking with COIs and clients, if you take them to happy hour, you get a beer out of it. <laughs> Very true. Um, okay, so uh, stems two questions from that. Uh, so kind of going back to where you talked about the mission statement and trying to build that cohesive uh, shared commitment, um, a question came in, how long did it take you and your management team to develop the declared mission statement that everyone understood and can identify with? Well, let's see, it took uh, 14 years, uh, 
11 months, <laughs> 8 days, and <laughs> and 7 hours. No. So work in progress, Bill. Uh, so that, always that we keeping it to top have. of mind. Exactly. It's always work in progress. But our specific mission that we're on right now, we hired a business consultant named Richard Eppel from a company called Strategic Momentum to do a two-day off-site strategic planning session with our entire leadership team, all of our managers, department heads, the executive team. And he took us through a whole process to really figure out what we wanted our mission to be, what the market would bear, and what, what we were capable of. And we didn't have to know exactly how we were going to get there. We just had to make the declaration, like we're going to the moon. We don't know how we're going to the moon, but we're going to the moon within five years. And once we had that, that declaration shared across the entire team, it was extremely powerful. And then we've spent every day since then working on a plan for how to get there. And we've been executing that plan, and we're going to continue executing that plan because we're going to continue to stay committed, recommit when we need to, and gain that enrollment from the team. Right. And so basically what you're saying as the owner, uh, you know, you really need to lead and drive the vision and be on top of it. Um, because I know I run yes. into partners that, you know, the business owner, the president, whoever, someone made the decision to buy into the, the notion of managed services and buy the software, put it on the shoulders of one person, and then kind of walk away. And then, you know, I'm, I'm working through the challenge to say, you know, we're not being successful. We're not seeing the growth that we wanted. And you're kind of echoing what I've, what I've anecdotally have come across in, in my own line of work that the businesses where the owner is intimately involved, communicating that vision, driving that vision, making sure everybody is, is aware of that vision and, and, and follows the same vision, that really kind of sets the two apart between success and not as much success as maybe they would like. Exactly. And if you think about it, the enrollment has to be real. It cannot be fake. You can't just have people uh, giving, giving lip service. You have to have an honest conversation about it. And that, it's not just one conversation. It's a series of conversations over time. And at a minimum, you should be having those conversations one-on-one, -on -one, or someone should be having those conversations one-on-one -on -one with their employees, their team members, on a quarterly basis. The more often you can have those conversations, the better. Excellent. Okay. Um, and then kind of going back uh, when we were, you were talking about, you know, even if you're a smaller um, organization and maybe we don't, they don't have outside salespeople, um, how would you, what kind of advice would you offer to those smaller MSPs that, you know, have a couple of employees, they're kind of jack of all trades, but, you know, obviously there has to be some sort of sales function done. Uh, to try and, and build that business because obviously they can't hire more people till we have the sales. Exactly. Well, look, that's not necessarily a bad problem to have. As the owners and executives of these companies, no one can sell it like us because we have the vision and it is so important to stay committed to that vision and stay confident in it. If you're not confident in it, then Prospects can see that right away, and someone else is going to come by and just run them over and steal the deal. So one thing there that I think is really important that, that we did wrong for a long time that I, I wish we had done differently was better packaging and pricing. You can't sell everything to everyone. And as you build the, the pipeline through the lead generation processes that we were talking about earlier, You'll start, as long as you're targeting the right type of client, you have to identify what that is. And, and, and again, you can't be everything to everyone. But once you identify that, you have to have a specific package that delivers that service consistently the same way every time. There are some things that you can be flexible on because this is IT, but the, the hours that they're getting from you, the team members they're getting, the type of teams they are, what the teams are accountable for, all that stuff is critical to being able to sell a managed services product. <clears throat> if you're just selling them that we do unlimited support, well, somebody else is probably going to come along or going to come along at some point and say, well, yeah, we do unlimited support, but how's that working out for you? 
Where's the, the vision for IT? Where's the technology roadmap? Are you doing quarterly strategic planning or annual strategic planning? Is there an IT budget? And do you guys have an IT steering committee? And what are you guys reviewing in that committee? How are you guys driving progress? What are you learning from all those support tickets that you're putting in? How are you using that information to bring the noise down in the future? How are you driving initiatives? So these are, these are things, these are elements of a managed services product that again, if we had early on done it the same way every time, it would have been so much easier to scale. And we eventually did, but, but it generated a lot of pain that could have been avoided. Very true, very true. Um, so another question has come in. Uh, in the beginning, how many staff members uh, did you start out with and what was the makeup of the employee base? Well, this is my partner, Dylan, and I for, I think, a year and a half for, or almost two years. And uh, we, we, still have, we still have employee number one on the team today. His name is James. He's a rock star, and he's our lead BCIO. Wonderful. And uh, we, hired him, we hired him, I think, 13 years ago now. And today, uh, more than 17% of our team has been on the team for more than 10 years. We have a lot of 10-year of vets on the team. And, again, when we hire people, we're looking for lifers. We're looking for people whose career roadmaps align with our growth so that uh, we can be on this journey together. And align with and the vision. And James' original role, say again? Align with the vision and your mission. Bingo. Exactly. Exactly. And James' original role was working in the field and, and working in the help desk. And I think he did uh, just about everything uh, on the operations side over the years. But uh, right after James, we hired a second person who was a uh, full-time help desk and then a, an accounting person, and, uh, and we, just, we just continued growing from there. And I tried to align the model on elements of a Fortune 500 IT department, like field tech, help desk, uh, IT manager, IT director, CIO, project manager, all the different engineers. And every time we, we started adding people, I started adding people that would fit into a Fortune 500 or at least a Fortune 1000 IT org chart. And today, that's the foundation of our packages. We're a virtual IT department. I don't even I don't even call us the managed service provider in the sales process. And what they're hiring is a very mature IT team who is going to spend the right amount of time working for their business based on their needs not full-time employees that you're only getting 50% utilization from. Okay. And so were there challenges that you had to overcome or that you faced when you were growing from the initial two or three employees upwards? Oh, yeah. Uh, everything was always a challenge, but we tried to approach everything with, you know, first and foremost, what was fair and best for everyone. Always do right by the clients. Always do right by the team members. That that approach cost us money, but at, but at the end of the day, uh, it it never hurt us. It was I think always the right thing to do. And okay. one other thing on on the growth that I wanted to mention, we grew up until about 1.5 million organically. And, and we had a lot of the, the elements that we have today in place, the VCIO process, uh, that, was, that was really starting to thrive. But we couldn't break through that $1.5 million hurdle for some reason until we brought in that consultant who got us together in a room for our first two-day off-site strategic planning session. And we declared our first mission, which was to get to $5 million at 20% EBITDA in five years. And it seemed impossible. We had no idea how we were going to get there. But not only did we get there, we actually hit 5.7 million on year five. But just declaring that mission and enrolling the team in it was all that it took to break through that ceiling. Wow. Okay. Fabulous. Um, so a couple of other questions are coming in. Uh, what percent production utilization do you look to achieve from a given tech? versus allowing time for training, R&D, and that type of thing? Well, for training in R&D, we have a specific training program at, that uh, everyone goes through and a training allotment so, so people can decide what they want to get trained on every year based on their career roadmap. 
that just that time gets billed back to the team or back to the company in in ConnectWise. And for everyone, we're looking for 80% utilization, and that includes the R&D and the training time. Just that R&D and training time uh, comes out to probably probably half half a week to a full week per year for a team member. But some can be more, and some can be less, depending on their roles. Okay. Um, and what is the ratio uh, within Centrix of the help desk to knock techs? We only have two techs in our knock, and then those guys uh, do the day shift, uh, you know, 12-hour a day, day shift, Monday through Friday. And then uh, we outsource the after-hours knock piece to a company in the, in the UK called InBay, who's also a SolarWinds partner. They're like the MSP's MSP. Yep. So we only have two guys, uh, two full-time employees in the knock. If you count the, the money that we're spending with InBay, that, that probably counts as another two. Okay. And we have 12 guys on the help desk supporting over 5,000 users, also running in a couple shifts that run 12 hours a day. Wow. Okay. Gosh, so many questions coming in. Um, so what is your average monthly price billing amount for a 25 or 50 user organization? Like maybe talk about, you know, when you talked about you need to better package, you need to better price. Um, can you talk about what you offer out today to your customers? Yeah, so our packages, we have a couple of different packages that are optimized for different business case scenarios. Low growth usually creates low complexity because there's low change. Change really drives complexity in IT, and growth is one of the biggest fuels of change. So if, if a company is low growth and, and fairly operationally mature and nothing's changing, we have a package that's optimized for them because we just need to spend less time on site and there's just less stuff for IT to do. But the core package still includes the same fundamentals as the larger packages, which are optimized for companies that are high growth, and with high growth comes more employee attrition, uh, building out new locations. I mean, there's just all sorts of stuff that you have to do that you don't do in a low growth company. But they also have that strategic planning and leadership component. That's the VCIO process. They have the proactive component, which is the full-time IT manager. They have the NOC. In some cases, they have the SOC because we have a managed security services offering also that we sell independently of the managed services offering, and the help desk and field team supporting them. The big differences are what we're doing with the time and, and whether or not we have pre-scheduled time on site or unlimited time on site. And that's based on business case scenarios. The other package that we have is more optimized for large uh, clients. We have a couple of Fortune 500 companies that are clients in San Diego where uh, they've outsourced almost all of the IT to us without, with the exception of the leadership component. And we have packages that are optimized for that scenario where we're doing most of the, of the, of the MSP component, but not quite all of it. All right. And in terms of uh, pricing, the pricing ranges between $100 a user and $175 a user per month, depending on the package and depending on how much time we're spending on site. Remember, for us as business owners, it's just a calculation of tools and time. How much do our different team members cost? We can control the CIO, the IT manager, the, the NOC. Uh, we, we have a lot of control over those roles. The help desk and the field is the one that we don't have as much control over. So by, by putting those controls in place and factoring in pre-scheduled time on site, now we have better control over that, which helps improve the margin. By having the IT managers focused on proactive stuff that, that prevents future tickets from coming in based on past tickets that have come in, that reduces the noise in the help desk, which, which drives that margin up. Right, okay. So when you talked initially that you have a couple of different based on whether you see them as being a low growth or high growth type of prospect, I'm assuming there's some sort of assessment that's being done ahead of time so that you can determine what would be the package they would fall into. Can you talk about that? 
yes, our, our outside sales guy, or me if it's a larger deal, we just have a conversation with them about their business plan, what, what's their mission. It's just as important for us to know what their mission is to make sure that we align with it. And if they don't have a mission or a business plan, that's a red flag for us. They're, they're probably a lifestyle business or someone that we're not going to be able to help as much as a company who has a specific mission that we can align with and commit to. It's just a conversation. Okay. All right. Anything from a technology perspective uh, in evaluating their network that you do to kind of help move that sales cycle along for you? We talk about, no, we do very little evaluation during the sales process because that's what we do as soon as we start onboarding. We create a huge IT run book that's ISO based that has all the documentation for their network, the keys to the kingdom, the secret sauce, the intellectual property for IT. All that gets done during the onboarding process and that's where we catch a lot of the mistakes that other vendors have made in the past. And you wouldn't believe what we find. But we set that expectation going into it and usually don't activate service until two to four weeks after that, uh, after that process begins. And if there are All immediate right. fires, uh, we'll we'll address them yeah. through a yeah, short-term tactical course. plan. But we want to do as much we want to do as much of the change management through strategic planning as possible, and not come in there with a bunch of changes that may be poorly planned and not ready to be executed. Okay. Uh, so again, so many questions, Eric. So what, uh, when you were starting out, what was your target profile of a customer that you were looking to attract? And then uh, has this changed today? Anyone with money who knew how to say the word IT. <laughs> it was all over the place. We tried to be everything for everyone. And that just didn't scale. But what happened was when we hired that consultant, we took a look at our client base during that strategic planning session and realized, oh my God, 65% of our clients are in healthcare. We're a healthcare IT services company. Now we had a profile to build on and that's then scaled into other regulated verticals. We're very strong with heavily regulated IT. Okay. Uh, and then when trying to onboard a new prospect that maybe is already you know pretty happy with their current IT provider um, you know what you know kind of going back to the assessment lines of questions like you know what do you do in terms of an audit discovery you know what do you do to show value to get that client to look at you and possibly interested and then ultimately switch again you can't be everything to everyone and and good clients aren't going to switch because of an audit usually there has to be a compelling reason and everybody has good service. Everybody has a friend of a friend who's an IT guy. That's why you have to know what their business mission is so you can relate what you do to concerns with them accomplishing the results of their mission. Okay. And what would you Without say to be that, the number one? Commodity right, and so based on that, uh, what would you say would be kind of the number one MSP service that you're selling today? You mentioned you have your packages, your security is a totally separate offering. Oh yeah, the managed services package is definitely the, the largest one. The managed security package is the most rapidly growing. It's extremely hot and it's the first package that we're gonna be offering to companies that aren't under a managed services agreement. And this is an enterprise-based managed security package that's really scaled down to the small business small business results, and small business price point. Okay. Uh, and then in your packages, do you provide all of your IT services remotely, or do you even include uh, some sort of component where you'll put an engineer on site for some period of time each week or each month? Yes, that, absolutely. That's what I was talking about earlier. If they're a okay. highly regulated, highly sophisticated, or high growth organization, there's more IT stuff to do, and that's when you need to staff the resource on site. With some larger clients, we have multiple resources staffed on a reoccurring schedule, but not, not every day. That's part of the trick is you, you can't turn it into someone's full-time job. If you need to have two IT resources there full-time, 
you can spread that out that across a handful of different people, uh, four or five different people, so it doesn't feel like they work there. And the client likes it because they're talking to a whole team of IT people, not just one guy. And you lower the risk of that one guy leaving with some sort of intellectual property in his head. Right. Okay. So. Do you have a breakdown of what percentage of tickets are resolved remotely via your help desk versus having that need to dispatch and send someone out on site? Oh yeah, almost every ticket is resolved remotely. Only 33 out of about 500 tickets, so 66 out of 1,000, get done on site. Wow, okay. Um. But by the way, the, the big secret to that is standardization. That was one of the other things we did right early on. I standardized the hell out of everything based on what worked okay. in the Fortune 500, Fortune 500 reference architecture, because I knew it could scale and I knew it was reliable and I knew it would help comply with regulations that we were dealing with in healthcare. And that, that simple secret vision of standardization has allowed us to grow and scale to the point we're at today by having a small and efficient team who's trained on a handful of core technologies that we don't compromise on. And when we onboard a new client, we'll take them with whatever they have, but we start road mapping them immediately to that, that point of standardization based on the pain. And if it's not causing pain, we'll, we'll standardize it when it hits its uh, life cycle. If it is, then we'll get it out right away. Okay, and that leads to another question that came up is, you know, how do you manage and balance a customized approach to IT where clients will come in with different software and have different sort of environments, um, you know, so that how would that differ from kind of your notion of standardization and how do you prevent scope creep when you have stuff like that? Well, again, you have to be able to onboard them and take them as they come because they're never going to be perfect. That's why they're hiring you. And you have to have a process to roadmap those changes so you start standardizing over time. And if it's a small company, you might be able to do it quickly. If it's a large company, then uh, those, those things need to be planned maybe over a multi-year process. But it's just a matter of budgeting, planning, and execution. And identifying pain points or gaps with regulatory requirements, that can, that can help drive change at a faster rate. Um, so looking at the cross-section of customers that you're supporting, um, question came in, how many endpoints do you manage in, say, your smallest set of customers? You know, we have a couple of small ones. The, the floor is really around 20 or 25, but we've got the, you know, a rock star neurosurgeon in San Diego who individually bills $7 million a year in, in revenue, just him. And he's got a staff of eight or nine people supporting him, and he's still willing to pay the same as a 20-person organization because IT is just that mission critical for him, and he cannot capture that $7 million a year without high-quality IT. Okay. But for us, unless, they're, unless it's business critical or mission critical, unless IT is business or mission critical to accomplishing the results of their business plan, we rarely end up going below 20 users because somebody can come in with mediocre results and it's just not going to impact the bottom line or the results of their business plan too much. If it's high growth, it will. Right. All right. Um, so another question. Early on when, you know, you're first starting out the MSP practice and you're really going for every, you know, contract that you can get, how do you avoid getting manipulated by customers who want to veer outside of your scope of contract to get something for free? Um, you know, they're afraid to push back uh, because that could be a risk. Um, and so you kind of let things slide um, until you have other kind of yeah. recurring revenue to, to come in. You know, any advice on how to prevent this, stop it, cancel it, <laughs> yes. move on from it? You ha yes, absolutely. You have to have your packages defined and very well documented so you can say, uh, Steve, the CEO, Steve, uh, I'd love to be able to do this for you, but remember, the package that you're under is for X, Y, and Z, and 
and I'm sure you can understand, you have costs for doing stuff, and, and so do I. In order to do this, in order to process this request, I have to bring in a specialist, and that's not included in the package. Remember we talked about that during the sales process, and that's why I have to bill you for the change, because I have to pay a specialist to do it. That's all it is. And if you can relate it to a, to a, a business scenario like that, they're going to probably be familiar with it, and they're going to understand. If, they, if, if your packaging and, and pricing isn't clearly defined, that's when you get scope creep because they think, well, wait a minute, you're the IT guys. Shouldn't you just be doing this? Right. And that's where we get into trouble. Right. Okay. Uh, so I guess on the product uh, program side of things, um, products that you're using today that you offer within your managed securities uh, tier. Products, well, I mean, are you talking about like our, our MSP stack, like SolarWinds ConnectWise, or are we talking about hardware yeah. and software that we synthesize our clients' environments on? Uh, what products do you use to offer your managed security services offering? So I guess ah, hardware, security. software, yeah. yeah, security, yeah. Well, same thing. That's a combination. So just like in the managed services world, we have all those roles clearly defined. Instead of a VCIO, we have a VCISO, and they do X, Y, and Z every quarter. They attend the IT steering committee meeting every quarter. They attend the strategic planning session once a year. They write the security plan, and they, they help draft and approve a written information security policy based on NIST 800 and ISO 27001 if the organization doesn't have one. Instead of a NOC, there's a SOC, a security operations center. Instead of an IT manager, there's a, an information security manager. So all these roles are clearly defined, and the tools that help support that outcome all align with NIST 800 requirements. Alien Vault is the tool that we use for FIM and SIEM. There's a lot of security stuff that we do inside of SolarWinds and Central for things like application compliance or uh, helping establish the approved device and pro approved applications list and enforcing them. And then uh, antivirus tools like, like Sophos, uh, we use a lot of integrated Sophos products because they talk to each other. The, uh, their email security solution, their endpoint encryption, all those go back to NIST standards, which by the way, most regulation including HIPAA is based on NIST 800 or ISO 27001. So by aligning with those standards, you're going to create a very defensible position for your clients and right out of the box comply with most regulatory requirements, most IT regulatory requirements. Okay. We also use Duo um, for two-factor authentication oh, right. and one login yep. for a single sign-on. And okay. IBM uh, Mass 360 for mobile device management. Okay. Um, so do you have these security people in-house, or do you have strategic partners that you bring in from a technology perspective, consulting perspective, you know, if it's not your key competency? Yeah, so what we did there was uh, we built those capabilities in-house through career road mapping. We have all those capabilities in-house today, and we identified engineers along the way from different backgrounds. Some are from the NOC, some are from the help desk some were network engineers from the build team who wanted to grow and mature into a cybersecurity role. They wanted to become a, 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 a VCIO someday. They wanted to get their CISSP. They wanted to become a certified security engineer. Whatever it was, we built those capabilities in-house, and once we had enough reoccurring revenue to support them in full-time positions, we made the change. We moved them onto the security team, and hired a new person or, or grew a new person from another team to backfill their previous role. Okay, so one of the other questions that came in is how did you avoid adding more people as your customer base grew? That's not necessarily what you avoided. You don't seem to be afraid to have add those people as you needed to add them because obviously you, you had the vision of where you wanted Centrix IT to go, but I'm assuming you also leveraged, you know, the complete automation. You talked about standardization, making sure everybody kind of looks the same um, so that you were 
maximizing the people that you had, but you knew that yeah. you would have to grow and, and add people as needed. Well, yeah, exactly. You have to know what the leverage metrics are so you know when to hire someone. So think, so, and this goes back to the packaging and pricing. You have to be de de delivering a consistent package that has a consistent cost so you can produce a consistent gross margin and fund the growth of your company and know when to hire people. And without that, I mean, back when we had no idea what that was, we just hired people because it felt right, because we felt busy. But we're always going to feel busy. We're in IT. We need to know that a person needs to be able to produce X, Y, and Z results in a specific role, and that we need A, B, and C of them in that role until we get an additional X amount of recurring revenue. So think about it as a pie. If just your help desk team took up 40% of that pie, and that pie represented the money that a client was paying you for a managed services contract, you know that you can't have too many people on that team because it's going to overinflate that percentage, and that's what's going to start eroding the margin. Okay. Uh, another question that came in, you know, how do you show value to your customers when they don't see your IT staff on site uh, and problems are being handled remotely? Well, remember, we are always going to be on site to some degree, those IT managers are going to be on site for a full day a month or a quarter, depending on the size of the company, or possibly a full day a week doing proactive stuff, documentation, uh, audit prep, all the stuff that an IT manager would do in a larger organization, testing backup, uh, backups when test uh, restores, additional cybersecurity testing, holding the other teams accountable, checking service uh, delivery metrics for their, for their clients. They're going to be on site when they do that, specifically so that IT has a consistent leadership base in their organization from our team, and they're going to see the VCIO at a minimum on a quarterly basis, and the point of contact is going to be on a weekly or monthly IT cadence call with the VCIO and the virtual IT manager. You don't want your, so here's the thing, you don't want people to think that they only see IT when there's a problem. They want IT, you want them to think of IT as that, that badass proactive team that's preventing problems from happening. That's why you never see the support guys on site. You see them occasionally, but if all you see is the support guys on site, that means that you probably have a reactive IT model and someone else who offers a different future might swoop in and, and take that client. Okay. So are you saying that the majority of your customers um, are local to your area or you know, do you um, support businesses kind of outside of your local area? Is there kind of a breakdown of that? Yeah, so that was kind of funny. Uh, we didn't necessarily have to go multi-geography, but we did because our larger clients started going outside of San Diego. So we had to spread up to LA, Riverside, and, and all the way up to the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay. Um, and one other thing on that, as we, as we did that, based on our client's growth, we started road mapping how much MRR we would need to hire a full-time employee for that geography, and then unleash the sales machine on that geography so that we could fund a person and a small satellite office. Okay. Uh, okay, so one of the, uh, another question that's come in, please say some more about standardization. Does that mean clients have the same type of equipment, software, uh, just looking for uh, a larger um, expanded explanation on that? Yes, to all. Uh, clients are going to have different primary business applications, but the hardware stack that's supporting them, that should be largely the same. The types of internet connections they have, the types of endpoints that they're using, the way that you have them configured should be the same across the board. Your design specs, your requirement specs, that they should all be standardized. That's what produces scale and eliminates a lot of the noise that some MSPs just get crushed by. 
Okay. Uh, some billing related questions. Um, is there a multiplier for each employee you use when hiring? As an example, uh, 80,000 total comp for an employee is your target for that person to generate, you know, 240,000 per year as kind of a three times multiplier? Yep, it's very, very close to that. And right now, right now we're, we're going for 250K per employee across the board and we're at about 238 and rising. Wow, okay. And do your technicians have a monthly objective on billing block hours? No, because we don't have any block hours. We're a managed, yeah. we're an outsourced okay. IT department. We're a virtual IT department. Nothing we do is based on block hours. It's all pre-scheduled. Perfect. I kind of set you up for that one. Um, how do you handle specific line of business applications that you may not have the expertise with? One of the requirements in our contract is that they have a support agreement with all of the primary business application providers. So if it's an LOB like uh, like a financial system, that has to be under support, and our team will escalate. The IT manager during onboarding will read the requirement specs of that application and make sure that every computer has the right version of .NET or the right version of Java or the right XYZ, whatever, and make sure that's standardized across the board because that's where 80% of all the application-related noise comes from previous IT guys who didn't read the requirement specs and had the wrong version of something all over the place and it caused errors and pain and inconsistency. And by the way, the IT manager does that check every quarter. It's that critical. Okay. So just uh, trying to scroll through the questions. Uh, I know we're almost coming to the top of the hour. Um, Bear with me as I want to make sure that we get as many of these questions uh, answered. How many customers are per virtual IT team are you servicing? I don't know if many customers. It's not per number of customers, it's, it's the, the amount of revenue. So a VCIO on our team can support about $250,000 a month in reoccurring revenue. A virtual IT manager can support 85 to 90. Okay. Uh, and that might be two. that might be five clients, it might be three clients, or it might be fifteen. Okay, and it kind of leads to the next another question that's come in. You know, what's the smallest size client you would take, kind of money wise? Two grand a month, simply <laughs> because, simply because we have the base cost of doing vitamin BCAO and all these higher level functions. We have to cover our base cost, and and that's why we're not everything for everyone. And what was magic is when we hit that, when we set that two grand a month minimum, the average deal size all of a sudden jumped by like $1,500 a month. Okay. It was, it was magic think, and unexpected. Okay. And uh, we have time for probably two more questions. Um, one that I want to ask that we'll end off with, uh, but this last one that came in, and for those that asked questions and we weren't able to get around to it, our sincerest of apologies, um, we'll get those questions over to Eric and uh, see if he'll be kind enough to answer them uh, for us and we'll send them out. Uh, and here's one that I think we should all know the answer to already, but I'm going to ask it so you can just reinforce the fact. How do you handle clients that do not comply with standardization? In other words, they won't invest in the software or equipment to meet your standards. We give them every chance to succeed. We continue to relate pain points or, or problems to their mission and their business plan. And if it's just because they are a lifestyle business and they're just not willing to do it, that's their part of the deal, by the way. That's the quid pro quo. We're going to give you these results, but you have to invest this budget the way that we recommend. And if it's not a good fit, we'll let them out of the contract. And, the v, and one of our VCIOs, or, or even me, will call the person and have an authentic conversation about those concerns, relate the concerns to the results that we're getting, make sure that they, they want or don't want those results. And if they don't care about the results, I've got a great guy in San Diego 
who is an amazing break fix uh, MSP, and and he thrives on that type of business. And I will help facilitate the transition over to his team. Okay. All right. Um, but you, you you can't just fire him. You have to do it in a way that's committed to their success. Okay. Perfect. And I lied. I have two more questions. Um, so if you were to pick one single item, either training, technology, process procedures, marketing, selling tools, whatever that happens to be, what would you say would have the biggest impact on your MRR and that you would want to focus on? Uh, I would say the biggest impact would be understanding your margins, where the margins are coming from, where your bleeding margin, and moving forward, hold that margin sacred and only take on clients that are going to produce the right amount of margin and start growing that way. Once you do that, everything else starts falling into place because if you just grow the revenue without the margin, then you're just treading water. And by the way, one of the metrics that I learned from uh, Paul Dippel, who runs the Service Leadership Index, is that 50% of MSPs are either losing money or barely making any money, and it's not enough money to fuel growth. That's, that's half of our industry. That's a huge problem, and that all comes from margin and the lack of understanding around how to control the margin with the packages that you're selling and delivering. Okay, perfect. And then uh, my last final question um, is, how important would you say SolarWinds uh, has been to your business? Thank you. Eric, did you go? All right, I'm go going to think that maybe something happened to uh, Eric's um, Good thing it happened at the end <laughs> and not uh, during it. But uh, either way, um, that wraps up our, our session for today. I do want to thank uh, Eric um, for, you know, kind of opening up uh, how we conduct this business and offering this fantastic uh, advice. As mentioned, this session was recorded. So it will be sent out to everybody on this call today uh, in the coming days. If your questions were not answered, we'll get them compiled, we'll get them over to Eric, we'll get them to answer, uh, because there was a lot of questions that came in that my apologies, we weren't able uh, to get across, uh, uh, to get to. But I do want to thank everybody uh, today for attending. Thank you, Eric. Uh, this concludes our webinar today, and uh, I wish you uh, a great, great uh, rest of the day and a great weekend. Thanks, everyone.